Good evening. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube live event tonight. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Pira. I'm a board certified neuropsychologist and the director of the concussion program at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush and Rush University Medical Center. I have been working with individuals who have suffered concussion and other traumatic brain injuries for 25 years. As you can imagine, it's been quite a ride. We have seen incredible improvement in our ability to recognize, assess, and treatment of concussions over that time. I am particularly proud of the work that we're doing at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush and Rush. We have a team of experts with years of experience working with concussions. We are using the most up-to-date technology and treatments for people who suffer new concussions, as well as people who have persistent symptoms after concussion. So tonight, we're going to try to talk about a number of things, but please also, if you have questions, look at that chat button down there and send me questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can tonight. But I want to talk about some concussion basics and then kind of walk you through what we do if you have a concussion and your child has a concussion, um, how we get people back to school and work and back to play safely. So let's start with the definition. Uh, concussion occurs when somebody is struck directly in the head or to the body that moves the head forcefully, which results in changes in mental status. That means confusion, disorientation, memory loss. Um, you do not need to be knocked unconscious to have self with a concussion. And we make a distinction between what we call signs and symptoms of concussion. So signs are those things that are observable by other people. Symptoms of concussion are those things that the patient or, you know, reports themselves. And I do a lot of education with coaches and parents and athletes because we really do want people to understand what to look for. So let's say you are on the sidelines of your child's soccer game and your child or another athlete falls and hits their head and they get up and they're wobbly and they're showing some imbalance. You know, that may be a sign of concussion. Some that would be called gross motor coordination. If you're talking to the child and they seem confused or they're slow to respond to their your questions or they don't remember being hurt or they don't remember the score of the game or who they're playing, that may be an indication that they suffer a concussion. Sometimes it can be something like personality changes. Uh, sometimes after a concussion, people are really emotional, irritable, tearful, sometimes even goofy. So we're looking for changes and what's different from that person's normal state. The symptoms of concussion include things like headache, nausea, uh, dizziness, imbalance, ringing in the ears, change in vision, things like blurred vision, double vision, seeing spots, sensitivity of light or sound, fatigue, um, and cognitive changes, I mean, thinking, thinking changes. So people describe that all kinds of different ways. They'll say they feel foggy, cloudy, loopy. I, I hear all kinds of things. But that's a strong indication that some of you have actually suffered a concussion if they're reporting those symptoms. And I wanted to get really clear, we do not want parents or coaches to try to make this decision. Um, you know, you heard the saying, when in doubt, took them out. If a concussionist is suspected, just remove that athlete from the play, remove someone out of the, the situation where they may get injured again, and, and have a medical professional make the decision. I'm a strong advocate for athletic trainers. These are clinicians who are well-trained, experienced in assessing concussion. Um, and they also can tell you if there's any indications that something more serious has happened. Because we do look for things that we call danger signs. And this indicates that the person may need to go to the hospital more urgently. So we take any loss of consciousness seriously, but we also look for things that are, are rare, fortunately, but things like seizure activity, uh, uh, one pupil being uneven, repetitive vomiting, um, severe neck pain or inability to move an arm or leg that may be suggestive of spinal cord injury. But the real thing to look for is, are the symptoms getting worse and not better? Typically when you remove somebody out of, uh, uh, out of play or move them somewhere quiet, the symptoms stabilize or even improve a little bit. If somebody's telling you their headache is really increasing, they look more confused to you, they look more tired, you can't keep them awake, they're having trouble speaking, really need to take them immediately to the emergency room. We take all those things very seriously. In the ER, you likely get a CT scan, uh, and the CT scan is done to rule out more serious pathology, like uh, bleeding of the brain, hemorrhage of the brain. Um, a CT scan does not rule in or rule out a concussion. 
CT scan is just looking at those more serious injuries. So a negative CT doesn't mean to have a concussion. So you know, if your child or you do not have to go to the emergency room, if your symptoms can be monitored, I do recommend that people to contact their pediatrician or the primary care doc for uh, advice on how to uh, handle the initial symptoms. And then it's simply a matter of monitoring those symptoms over time. One of the biggest misunderstandings about concussion is this notion about the rest. So the data tells us the first one to two day, days after concussion, we do want people to rest. We want you to take it easy. The brain is using a lot of energy to heal. People are very tired. And they can be really symptomatic. I just feel awful. So we want them to sleep some more and do things that don't aggravate their symptoms. But what we know is that beyond about two days, rest doesn't make a difference. In fact, in fact it makes it worse. What we, the data tells us that people who are overly restricted actually take longer to recover. So we don't want to keep people in dark rooms. We don't want to take away their phones or their computers or their TVs. You know, we tell people concussion shouldn't be a punishment for these kids. You are not going to melt your brain if you watch, you know, watch a movie or text your friends. It's really about managing your symptoms. So we're trying to get people away from focusing on rest and really talk about symptom management. What's bothering you? And we know that when we get people back to activity sooner, they actually recover sooner. So, you know, we generally tell people to take a day or two off of school to work and then we want to get them back. So I know COVID has sort of thrown a wrench in everything, but in normal times, we uh, try to get kids back to school as soon as possible. You know, we all do better in our routine, and kids do better when they're around their friends. But I write a lot of letters for academic accommodations and for work accommodations. Because the idea is that you want to be in school so you're not overwhelmed. You're not, you're not sitting at home thinking about how much you're getting behind in your schoolwork or your, or your work responsibilities. But just make accommodations in the school or work environment to try to lessen those triggers for the symptoms. And then, we, again, we monitor those symptoms. Generally, most people take somewhere between one to three weeks to recover from concussion. It's not a hard, fast rule, but it just sort of gives you a general timeline. Some people take more, some people recover very quickly. Um, it's not unusual for children to take longer. We also know that people with certain types of history, like a history of migraines, a history of uh, depression or anxiety prior to the concussion, can take longer to recover. But unfortunately, if you're still having headaches at two weeks, that stinks, but it's not abnormal. However, if you're still having symptoms at six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, you really need to go see somebody who specializes in concussion because there are really good effective treatments that are available to, to our patients. And the research tells us that the sooner someone goes in to see a concussion specialist, the sooner they recover. And this is because we simply make individualized treatment recommendations and accommodations to manage those symptoms more properly, and we intervene sooner. So don't let anyone tell you that it takes days and weeks and months to recover from concussion. We really want to stay on, on top of those symptoms. So how do we know when somebody's safe to return to play? It's a question that I get all the time. You know, I tell people, we don't have a perfect way to know that someone's suffered a concussion. And we don't have a perfect way to know that someone has recovered. You can't look inside your brain and say, yep, we know they're recovered. So there's three things that we basically look for. And this is the same from the little guys all the way up to professional athletes. The first is that you are without symptoms at rest and with exertion. So if you're just sitting around doing nothing without symptoms, that's fine. But you need to be in your own routine, right? You need to be uh, you know, going to school, going to work, being physically active, including up to non-context you know, practice, and, and still remaining without symptoms. We want to push that envelope to make sure that we're not finding you know, something that you're doing is, is causing the symptoms. The second thing is that your balance and your ocular testing has to be normal. And the third is that your cognition or your thinking needs to be normal. And we judge that a couple different ways. You know, are you performing normally as you would in school, um, in work? And for, in two situations, we also do cognitive testing to look for evidence of recovery. But I tell people, you know, everybody has to be comfortable. So, you know, if parents want to extend that return to play and keep their kids out a little sooner, just feel comfortable, that's fine. We want the athlete, the parent, the doctor, the coach, everyone to feel comfortable 
and not rush this return to play. Because the worst thing we want to do is send someone back before they're recovered. Because we know that we can see not only an increase in another concussion, but there's actually evidence that tells us if someone goes back to play too soon, they have an increased rate of musculoskeletal injuries. So you're not helping your team if you're going back and you're going to get re-injured again. So we tell athletes all the time, work with us, we'll get you back to play, but we'll do so only when it's safe. All right. So that's a general overall. Um, we have some questions coming in. And so thank you, Allie. Is there an age that's too young to play sports, more at risk of concussion? It's a great question. So we do know that there are indicators that children are more susceptible to concussions for reasons such as neck strength. So obviously, if you have weaker neck, you need more moving the head. And you control your body well enough to prevent injuries. We also know that there are, there are physiologic differences in the brain anatomy that makes kids more prone. So we don't have a good uh, evidence to say in a particular sport at a particular age. So, you know, we do encourage non-contact practice, you know, flag football earlier ages, now, you know, heading early as U.S. soccer. So there are regulations to try to introduce sport to kids in a, in a safer um, in a safer manner. Another common question that I, that I get is about helmets. So first and foremost, understand there is no concussion-proof helmet. Um, regarding what the marketing people might tell you, you cannot prevent a concussion from helmet. There are helmets that are better, but helmets were designed to prevent skull fractures and those more serious injuries, and they do an excellent job. However, if you're interested in looking at the ratings, Virginia Tech University does, um, uh, has for years, done a great job looking at uh, different sport helmets. So you can just Google, you know, hockey helmet ratings. And you go to the site, and they will tell you the ratings on different make manufacturers. Um, and so, but keep in mind that fit is really the important part. A poorly fitted helmet doesn't often stay in amount of protection. So you really want to make sure that helmet fits, and you want to check it regularly through the season because things do change. And you want to make sure that the, the, uh, the shell is intact, the padding, and the straps are okay. That's important, too, as far as offering a mark, amount of uh, um, protection. So, Eric, I'm saying get a question from Eric. Um, do moth guards help? It's a very common question I get as well. So this has been looked at really uh, closely. And moth guards are really important for protection of teeth and jaw, particularly those expensive braces. As somebody who has paid for my children's braces, I appreciate that. But unfortunately, the research has shown us that they don't make a difference in reducing the severity or the frequency of concussion. So while they have value, we don't want people to rely on it as it's a, it's a way of reducing concussion. So the same thing with your soccer headgear and other things that unfortunately haven't shown to be helpful when it comes to re reducing concussion. You know, what is helpful for reducing concussion is safe play. So, I mean, you really want to talk to your coaches about are they creating what I call an environment of safety? So, are they enforcing the rules? Are they talking about, um, you know, uh, not dangerous plays? Are they, are they staying up in the research? You know, one of the nice things about focusing on concussion is that we've looked at these sports really closely. And we look, for example, the Oklahoma drill should never be done in football. It's the highest, you know, cause of concussions in football. Um, do your coaches know those sort of things, what the evidence is pointing to? Um, are, are the athletes comfortable coming forward and talking to their injuries, to the coaches about their injuries? What we don't want is a situation where athletes feel like they'll be mocked or be ridiculed by their teammates or coaches if they're reporting concussions. Because, you know, keeping kids out of play who have a concussion is one of the most important things that we can do to prevent more serious injuries. So, Again, what is the best way to treat concussion? So, as we talked about before, there is no magic treatment. It really, I joke with my patients all the time, and I'll say, concussion management consists of, you know, time and not getting hit in the head again. So, the reason we pull people out of sports is, and activities, high-risk activities, is we don't want them having hit in the head again while they're recovering. There's a period of, of vulnerability where the brain is more sensitive to contact and obviously, I don't want people hitting their heads at all. But during this recovery time, we really want to keep people out of those activities. And then it's just symptom management. Remember, don't talk about rest. Symptom management. 
what are your individual symptoms and what is what is agitating those, those symptoms and monitoring your symptoms to see again if they're persisting is additional treatment necessary so who is more at risk boys or girls great question and interesting right before i came here today i was listening to a, a seminar from uh, the great Dr. Tracy Kovasa of Michigan State, who is uh, uh, probably the country's leading expert on this question. So what they do is they look at sports that both girls and boys play, and consistently, and we look at basketball, soccer, volleyball, um, you know, uh, hockey. When you see those sports that both uh, sexes play, consistently we're seeing a higher rate of uh, concussion in girls. There's a number of theories as to why. And you know, one of the theories was that girls are just more honest. And I, those of us who do this work always laugh at that because you have not worked with soccer girls because these girls are intense and I love it. But they're not coming forward and telling their, you know, their symptoms as well. So we want to make sure that we're not stereotyping. One of the theories is that it's a neck musculature issue. So weaker necks, more moving the head, more likely to, to have concussion. There's always also some research looking at hormones. So there's an increased rate of hormones during different stages of the menstrual cycle. So it's not that we're gonna keep girls out of play during those stages, but we're trying to understand why there's this very clear distinction in an increased rate of concussions in girls. Uh, another question, are headers safe? So I will tell you my bias, I'm not a fan of headers. I am, you know, like people hitting their head. Uh, and here's some of the research. And so I am on the U.S. Soccer uh, Concussion Task Force, and we've looked at this extensively. And the problem with a lot of the research looking at the concussion headers is done on you know Division One athletes who have perfect form. And if any of you ever watched <laughs> youth soccer game, the form is not exactly there. So we can't. We have to kind of compare apples to oranges. And so the biggest cause of concussion in soccer is not actually the headers, but what they call it in the process of heading. So Two kids are jumping up to head the ball, and they, they have poor sort of awareness of their environment, and they clunk heads. Um, so when the, when the person is straight, when they're doing the uh, header perfectly, we don't have evidence that that's a cause of concussion. But spatial awareness and body awareness is lacking in younger people. So you know that's one of the reasons why U.S. soccer has limited to under 10, you know, heading practice and 14 and under limited uh, heading practice. What role can an athletic trainer play? As I, I said before, I can't say this enough. I'm a huge advocate for athletic trainers. You know, these are individuals who, you know, have bachelor's or master's degrees, mostly, mostly master's degrees, have a lot of experience with athletes. And the thing I love about athletic trainers is they know these athletes. So they can tell oftentimes that something is just not right. I know this, like, I know this kid, and something is not right with them. And that really is important. And they know how to assess, they know what to look for, they can document these injuries and watch these kids serially. They can be involved in the exertional return to play process. Um, athletic trainers are a really key component of good concussion recognition and treatment. You know, unfortunately, in this country, about you know, about 37 percent of high schools have access to full-time athletic trainers, which obviously is not enough. And very few youth sports, you know, club club travel leagues, have athletic trainers. So I tell people all the time, don't spend all the money on fancy, you know, these gadgets that are coming out. Spend your money and get an athletic trainer on the sidelines. Is there any new research out? So our last question says, is there any new research out? Yes, uh, it's a very broad question, but you know there is research on, on so many aspects of concussion. That's why it's really exciting. And some of the research that I'm really most excited about is some of the ways we assess that people are still having symptoms, um, are still having, are still recovering from concussion. Things like ocular changes that we didn't look at years ago. So what we've been looking at what's called your vestibular system for a while. We're now looking really more closely at the ocular motor system, and that really is important because it, it it relates a lot to the symptoms. So if you're reading a lot, if you're a student, if you're studying, looking at a computer in class, those things can aggravate symptoms. So it's not the brain activity, it can be the ocular system. Um, we're looking at, at, you know, one of the things that we're doing at MOR and Rush is we're looking at uh, uh, predicting 
who may be at higher risk for muscular skeletal injury after a concussion. So we put together a protocol that looks at higher, you know, higher level balance and motor and motor activity that suggests that we need to treat that before we let people go back to these higher risk activities. So it's you know it's a constant battle to always be kept up, up on the research, but it's so exciting because in the end, what we really want is kids to play sports. I I'm a mom. I have two sons. They play all kinds of sports, including contact sports. And we want our kids engaged in activities they love and for all the positive benefits of sports. But safety has to be our number one focus. So the research is telling us how to, you know, what not to do, what what to reinforce, how to how to prevent injuries. Because really, our focus should be on prevention, prevention first and foremost, right? Um, but we also want to make sure that we are, you know, getting kids back to activities safely over and over and over and say enough. Can you do anything to prevent a concussion? So we talked about before, one of, the, it, you know, one of the biggest things that you can do is follow the rules. So, um, you know, one of my, I see a lot of hockey kids, and I kids play hockey, and I see a lot of hockey athletes. And, you know, someone will tell me a story about, you know, something, you know, cross tricked them, and then they went into the boards and they got a concussion. And I always said, that person, get a, they get a penalty. And I never studied it, but probably 80% 80, 80 of the time, the answer is no. We can't reinforce, we can't reduce those behaviors if there's not punishment. So we need consistency of rule enforcement. We need coaches and parents to create, again, an environment of safety, that we're encouraging safe play, that we're encouraging reporting of injuries. And, you know, equipment, it, it has a role. Helmets are important. Again, you know, a helmet that comes off when you fall offers no protection. Um, but ultimately, it's really about style of play, it's about rule enforcement, and it's about looking at ways to play the game that lowers that risk of, of concussion and all sports injury. So there's some fantastic work at MOR. We're doing a lot of research looking at other injuries, um, other things that prevent concussion. The NFL has done a ton of research. And I should mention before, too, we talked about hockey helmets. The NFL has also done a lot of work, engineering work. And you can Google the NFL helmet ratings for football helmets. And you'll see all the high performing helmets. But keep in mind that research is done on adults, not kids. Uh, which types of, I have another question from Peyton. Thank you, Peyton. Which types of impact were the head or more likely to cause concussion? So, you know, it's a great question that we don't actually have a good answer for because we consider a concussion more of a global injury. So, as the brain is moving inside the skull, there are all these pathophysiologic changes. Concussion is an injury that occurs at the cellular level. So we don't have any evidence that there's a particular part. Now, the bones around the temporal areas are thinner, um, but we also know we have to look at how do people get hurt, right? So there's the linear movement, and there's a rotational movement. And there's some evidence that when the brain, when the head rotates, that can be a, a higher risk of injury. So there's a lot of factors about, but we don't have really good data on exactly what causes the concussion because People are so different, the type of injuries they, they sustain are so different in various sports and activities. We've been talking about sports a lot, but we know, we know that people fall at home, they get in car accidents, they, you know, they get dropped on their heads and all kinds of ways. So at MOR and Rush, we treat you know the, all types of concussions regardless of how someone's injured. So this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Um, you know, hopefully we'll do it another time, but feel free to reach out to me at MOR. Um, with any additional questions. And have a good night. Thanks again, guys.